So I'm very honored to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, James O'Brien, to give us uh, perhaps a different perspective. James O'Brien is currently uh, working on his computer. Is currently uh, assistant professor of physics and mathematics in the College of Arts and Sciences here at Wentworth. He holds a PhD in theoretical physics as well as master's degrees in physics and abstract mathematics. Before pursuing higher education degrees, Professor O'Brien worked for IBM, performing VHDL simulations and logic design. Before coming to Wentworth, he taught at the University of Connecticut for seven years. While there, he was awarded the Teacher and Educator of the Year by the American Association of Physics Teachers. He has worked on numerous published research topics, including attempting to find a theoretical model for the bending of light by thin materials to form a cloaking device proposed terrestrial experiment for the detection of gravitational frame dragging, which could eventually be used for time travel, and most currently, an alternative theory to gravity that can explain away concepts currently heavily debated in Einstein gravity, such as dark matter, dark energy, and the cosmological constant. His most recent work, Quadratic Potentials in Conformal Gravity, was published in Physics Review Letters, and it was cited by Nobel Prize winner Gerhard de Hooft. That's a big deal. A musician himself, one of Professor O'Brien's favorite courses is Physics of Music, which culminated in the students designing and performing on homemade instruments. Please welcome James O'Brien. Okay, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, Ron, that was absolutely fabulous. I was just saying to Ron as he came over, it's amazing how much overlap we actually have. I want to just tell you a little bit of a brief story as to how I became involved with this, because it, the work of Elise is so fantastic. Ron, you know, kind of let me know about her work, and we met at a show that she had in downtown Boston, and Immediately after the show, I happened to be speaking at a conference in physics in Anaheim, California. And I told some of my colleagues, I said, well, this is great. We just, you know, met this artist who does this work called Quantum Singularities. And, you know, I'm going to be giving a joint presentation on this, hopefully come the fall. And a couple of them looked at me and they said, well, what kind of presentation would you do on art? And I thought to myself, this is really, really discomforting because if my own colleagues in physics don't see the connections between art and science. You know, perhaps it's not as clear to everyone as it is to me that the two of these subjects are not only intertwined throughout history, but really the intertwining of the two is what I believe will lead to the future advances in human science. So since I'm giving this talk uh, as a scientist that's entitled The Creator and the Observer, I'll be talking repeatedly about the dual role that scientists and artists play as the creator and the observer. But since it is a scientific talk, I figure I should let you know all the equations you'll need to know for this talk. So I hope you have some pen and paper because there will be an exam on this at the very end. I'm only joking. None of these will be used in the talk today, but I will require you to know one equation at the very end that looks much, much simpler than that. But instead, as Ron did, I want to start with a quote that I, first time that I heard this, I really thought was somewhat unexpected. As a young student in science, the first time I heard these words that imagination is more important than knowledge, I didn't really understand how to interpret this statement. Does anybody know who said this statement? Yes, this was Albert Einstein, okay? So we both started with a quote from Albert Einstein. Now this is the picture that I like to use of Albert Einstein because it shows Einstein in his early 20s. And believe it or not, when he published his work on the photoelectric effect and the special theory of relativity, he was only in his mid-20s. And this is what he looked like. This is the picture most of you might be you know, more familiar with about Einstein, okay? The crazy hair and always having some crazy slogan. but. The picture which I think is most important for this presentation is the one to the left. Because besides being one of the greatest scientific thinkers of all time, Albert Einstein also considered himself not only a philosopher, but an artist. Namely, he was an artist in the audio arts. He was a musician. Now, by all personal accounts of anybody that you talk to that has heard him play, they would probably tell you that he was definitely not a concert violinist by any standards. 
but it was something that he was not afraid to try and something that he believed was completely and utterly essential to his own understanding of his place in the world. So I want to take us back on a little journey all the way back to basically the beginning of human civilization. Okay? When humans evolved and we began setting up hunter and gatherer tribes, okay, people went where the food went. Okay? And language developed, you told tales through oral tradition, but sometimes this was not enough. People wanted to record their history and the earliest forms of art were formed. Cave paintings, paintings on walls that told stories about where people came from, where they were going, based on where basically the food was going. But if you look carefully at these early cave paintings, it wasn't only about where they've traveled and where they're going. There are signs buried into these early cave paintings about the natural world around them. You can see symbols of things that look like stars, things that look like planets, things that look like maybe a comet or something, okay? People observed the world around them. People started to do science from the dawn of time while they started to do art. Now, not only did they do both, after hunter and gatherer, okay, people started setting up more colonized civilizations for agricultural civilizations and all of a sudden we get the emergence of some fantastic pieces of not only art but some fantastic pieces of science. This slide on the right shows a very familiar looking Mayan calendar. Okay? It's not only a beautiful piece of art but it is actually one of the most precise scientific instruments ever created by mankind. The Mayan calendar Okay, can predict not only lunar eclipses and solar eclipses, it predicts everything all the way down to the cycles of the sun around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This is thousands and thousands of years ago. No telescopes, no Hubble telescope, no radio astronomy, no internet. And people could not only use it for the science that it manifested, but also could pre put it into this wonderful artistic piece of work. Obviously, some of you are familiar with this picture, probably from this Mayan 2012 prediction, which is buried into the calendar as well. But across the sea, okay, we have this other kind of emergence of scientific thought. Okay, and so the person who first made this little diagram that I'll explain very, very briefly was Socrates. Socrates had a very interesting idea. Okay? He believed that the way to human enlightenment was through philosophy. Now I think Socrates had some good ideas, but I think that he really left out quite a lot of information. Okay? The basis of what this diagram says is basically that you as a human are born into slavery and you are facing the wall. Okay? And you're facing this wall and all that you see on the wall is you see projections of someone behind you with an artificial fire that's playing basically the role of a puppet master and projecting images on this wall and you're staring at this wall and you believe what you see is reality. And the only way that you can actually see what is real, namely what is outside the cave, is for you to either be your own means, break your chains of slavery, or have some sort of philosophical educator who will obviously beat you on the head and drag you out of the cave. Okay? This was the only way that you could truly appreciate the good. But if you look closely on here, Socrates, one of the greatest thinkers of all times, associated scientists and artists as enemies because we were the people that were dictating what the masses see. I believe that his ideas that philosophical thought will lead you to true ideas are good but the fact of how one gets there cannot be done through philosophy alone. So even in ancient times art and science were definitely linked. Around this same time, okay, some of you might know I teach this class called the Physics of Music, so obviously this will be a relation that I'll use over and over again in this talk. A man by the name of Pythagoras walked the earth, okay? And Pythagoras is most well known for triangles, yes? The Pythagorean theorem, okay? But Pythagoras did a lot more than just triangles, okay? Pythagoras was also an artist. He was also a musician, okay? And he really wanted to take mathematics and make a relation between music and art. OK? 
okay? And what he noticed was that for stringed instruments, obviously it wasn't a guitar back then, but I'll just use this as the basis. For a stringed instrument, Pythagoras noticed that the frequency that we hear in our ears is directly proportional to the length of the string that is being plucked by the player, irregardless of how thick the string is or what material the string is made of. This allowed Pythagoras to fully, 100% mathematically, define sounds and the interactions of sounds and why certain sounds sound good together. These are what you call musical intervals. And he was able to provide the first mathematical basis for a musical scale. Now, that might sound fairly interesting alone, but if you look at this kind of innocuous column right here, there's a very, very funny word there. Planets. Okay? Pythagoras didn't stop there. Pythagoras did not stop at saying, okay, now I have what I was looking for, a mathematical relation amongst the scales. Instead, Pythagoras kept going because he realized that in the night sky, okay, there were these objects that did not stay fixed to the heavens. There were these objects that moved about, that wandered. The word planet. There were these objects that wandered, but they wandered in a very particular fashion. They went back and forth through some observable periodic motion. Ladies and gentlemen, when you pluck a string on a stringed instrument, it goes back and forth, yes? So if one object that, explicit, that, that exploited periodic motion played a frequency, perhaps all objects, oops, perhaps all objects that go through periodic motion would play a frequency. So Pythagoras wrote down what he called the music of the spheres, the music of the heavens. He tried to attribute a musical note to all the planets, the sun, the moon, and he called it the symphony of the heavens. Once again, linking science and art together. Now, I'll run with this music analogy just for another slide or so because it perfectly illustrates our role as both the creator and the observer. Because no matter who you are in this room, no matter how much you may consider yourself an artist or a scientist or lack thereof, I am willing to bet that everybody in this room listens to music and you've probably done so since you were a baby. Okay? You can continue to do this your entire life and listen to music and be, and be passive about music or you can partake in some music, yes? You can try to pick up an instrument. You can learn about the creative process of an instrument. Okay? You can even take it a step further and make it your entire life. Yes? But the bottom line is, at any stage along this game, you can have some appreciation for music. The same goes for art. Plenty of you, in many occurrences in your life, whether it's a school trip or something, have been to a museum, and you played the role of observer. Maybe then you went on to take a class, and you played the role of creator. And some of us go on to play the role of both. And this is one of the works of Elise Wagner that is shown in the gallery behind you. So the interplay of the creator and the observer is very prevalent in the sciences. We create by observing. It's also very prevalent in the arts. But that relation between the creator and the observer is very clear and dry. Around the same time that Einstein did the special theory of relativity, okay, we call everything that happened after Albert Einstein, we call modern physics. Okay? The other side of modern physics is what is called quantum physics. And I want to focus on this because Elise's work is entitled, or some of the works are called entitled Quantum Singularities. Quantum physics really changed the notion of the observer and the creator because one of the credos or the phenomenological properties of modern physics says that the observer, the act of observing, plays a direct role in the outcome of the experiment. Namely, the experiment that you create, the theory that you create, now can no longer simply be observed because the act of observing plays a role in the outcome. The classical example that you may have heard of is what is called Schrodinger's cat. Okay? No offense to any cats in here, this is not my experiment, okay? But I'll explain it to you the way it was originally concocted as a thought experiment. You have a box, you place into it radioactive material and a cat. 
Every minute, the radioactive material has a chance of radioactively decaying, thus releasing radioactive material into the cat. Okay? Thus, the cat has a chance to die. The box is closed. It has no windows. The cat can knock it out, and you cannot see what's going on inside the box. So, you look at the box, and it's not until you open it that you know whether the cat is alive or dead. So, until you perform the experiment, until you make the observation, the cat is simultaneously both alive and dead, yes? There is some equal probability that the cat is alive and the cat is dead. You are the one that, by making the observation, determines the outcome. The more friendly version of this is that the cat goes into the box, and when you open it, maybe it's there and maybe it's not. Okay? But the original version was somewhat more malicious, but the point is, is that the creator and the observer, the line is now very blurred. Because now, your observation is creating something new. This ties directly into what Ron was saying before about modern art, and how the creation of the art itself is the art. It's not necessarily always now about the finished product, but the process becomes part of the art itself. But not only this, what this means for you as the observer, and here are two more of Elisa's paintings that are in the back, you as the observer now are open to interpret things the way that you want because this is not simply a classical painting of a tree and you can say, oh, that's a nice tree or maybe I don't like that tree because the colors are off. Instead, you, the observer, now play an active role in creating your own interpretation. Once again, modern physics and modern art are intertwined where the role of the creator and the observer becomes blurred. The interpretation has many outcomes, many possibilities, just like the Schrodinger's cat. So we get this funny border now because if you realize what's going on, at the same time, physics in modern physics is trying to explain things that you can no longer see, right? We can't see the electricity running through the walls. You can feel it. We can see it manifested, but we cannot see it. It's the same thing with the world of quantum mechanics, the world of really small things and the world of really large things. How do you describe physics that you can't see? Well, like Ron said earlier, this is what artists have been doing for ages. Artists have always been capturing the unknown and showing us how to find it. So once again, we see that art and physics are overlapping. Now, before I go into Elise's work, I just want to show you one example that I didn't even realize until recently. This is a very famous work, right? Okay, Starry Night. This was painted, obviously, in the, in the artist's own style. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't, but it leaves things open to interpretation. But one of the things that I'd like to point out is that it contains some shapes that we only knew existed in the natural world when the Hubble telescope came around, namely the past 20 years or so. Yet these shapes are present in the starry night. Namely, we did not know that galaxies had pure spiral structure until the Hubble telescope. We did not know that the Milky Way band that you can see on a very clear night is because we are sitting in the extremum of a spiral galaxy. And even worse, or even more creative in my opinion, there is this swirl that exists here. These sorts of things actually do exist in telescopes. Namely, it's due to what is called gravitational lensing, light trying to travel through empty space, being interfered by a black hole. It causes the light to bend around the black hole, causing shapes like this literally in the real night sky. So I want to use some of this stuff that I've said to bring it back to Elise's work. And this is one of the paintings that you'll see in the back. This is the quantum singularities. This is a beautiful piece of art. And now I get to play the role of the observer. Obviously, I'm biased because I'm observing this from a scientific standpoint. But 
this work, which is entitled Quantum Singularities, I want to just do a brief explanation of. The, sci the uh, English dictionary will tell you that the definition of quantum is a discrete quantity of energy proportional in magnitude to the frequency of the radiation it represents. This is a good definition, actually. This is a really good definition because it's very similar to the one that we use in science. In science, we just remove the restriction that it has to be a bundle of pure energy, and we say that something that is quantum in science is something that can be broken down into distinct levels of something. Many of you who took chemistry might be familiar with the idea of orbitals, right? The electron must be in a distinct or discrete quantity called an orbital, okay? Some of you might also be familiar with the word quantum from the popular 80s TV show, Quantum Leap, although many of you in this audience I think might be too young for this. But a fun fact is that Quantum Leap actually had something to do with Scott Bakula going back and forth through time, which has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It does have to do with modern physics. This should have actually been called Relativity Leap, but Quantum Leap sounded much better. How about singularities? How does this word tie in? Well. The English definition is a noun. It's a peculiarity or an odd trait. Well, again, this is a fairly good definition, okay? In science, when we say something is a singularity, okay, it's a measurement, which should be some sort of positive number, but all of a sudden becomes peculiar. What do I mean by this? Well, we know something like the sun is a giant ball of hydrogen. It has some finite radius, yes? If you took a measuring stick and you measured the radius of the sun, that number better be positive, yes? But the sun has a tremendous amount of gravitational interaction, so what happens? Eventually, the hydrogen is going to cause the sun to collapse. Well, what happens if the sun collapsed so much that the radius became so small that it approached the number zero? You might think, well, that's not something so fascinating, but if you know a little bit of physics, you know that the gravitational attraction between two, option, between, uh, two objects is proportional to one divided by the radius squared. So what happens now if the radius is zero? You have one divided by zero, which all of your math teachers have been telling you since the dawn of time is not good, yes? You cannot divide by zero. Well, in physics, we actually have a definition for these things, and we call them singularities, peculiarities, yes, oddities. I also realized that while I was making this presentation, this might be a great new domain name for a singles dating website that we can call www.singularities.com. And if we really want to make it a quantum version, we can make it one of these things where when you check the site, sometimes you'll have a reply and sometimes you won't. So. Okay, so that was the quantum singularities. Now I want to highlight a couple of more works of art that Ron uh, showed in some of his slides as well. This one was called the counter collisions, and so I'll go through it based on my own observation. We can see here, okay, these distinct lines, these, dist these distinct trace lines. This to me, right away, appeared very, very similar to real physics. This picture here on the right, okay, is the real paths drawn out by collisions of two protons that go around these very, very large circular tracks, okay, in this facility which is called the particle accelerator. This enormous facility, which by the way, this is not the largest one in the world, has a sole purpose of sending protons extremely, extremely fast to crash into each other to make pictures like this. What happens when two protons collide? They release their constituents, and you literally get these photographs. And we can see traces of this work in Elise's work. So once again, the physics and the art are coming together. In her other one, Flare Horizons, okay, we see examples of things that look very, very similar in science. Solar flares a black hole absorbing another galaxy. All of these traits are shared in the artwork. Perhaps one of my favorites, which unfortunately is not on display here, is this one called Absolute Horizons. Right away when I seen this, I was immediately drawn to it because the overall shape and the overall implementation of these symbols, which I like to call, these are the quantum signals, right? The overall shape of this immediately made me think of this shape down here. Does anybody know what this shape is in the audience? Thank you. That's fantastic. This is one of the most astounding discoveries of all time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this picture down here is a real picture of what is called the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is a fingerprint. It's radiation that is left over from none other than the Big Bang. It really is out there. It permeates all of space and time. And believe it or not, if any of you were old enough to have one of these old TVs with a crank dial on it, you have even all seen the cosmic microwave background. If you've had one of these old TVs, the top middle channel was called UHF. Yes? And if you clicked it to UHF, it just looked like a bunch of snow. The reason it looked like a bunch of snow is because your satellite dish or your rabbit ears were picking up this three degree radiation from all possible directions and so there's no way it could make a cohesive signal. If you ever had one of these TVs, you got to see this picture in your own bedroom, namely you got to see the Big Bang in your bedroom. But nonetheless, you can see the correlation between these two photos and I won't go into too much of the physics behind it, but the red lines that permeate out of the center line here are what are called quantum fluctuations of the microwave background. They are small changes in the cosmic microwave background that represent where in the universe structure was formed. And we can see these sorts of lines emanating out from Elise Wagner's painting as well. I thought this connection was truly, truly astonishing. Now, I also had to change this talk about a week and a half ago because some of you who follow the news might have realized that some very new physics has recently happened. Okay? This object here, which looks crazy, these are people, by the way. These are all hand-blown glass tubes. Okay? They're photocells. Okay? And this whole entire tank here gets filled with heavy water. And you put this entire tank way underground, and you hope that you can see a neutrino coming from somewhere that collides with the heavy water and then excites these phototubes that makes a picture look something like this. Okay? The reason why I bring this up is because about a week and a half ago, it was discovered that neutrinos could possibly travel faster than the speed of light. Ladies and gentlemen, it is one of the credos of modern physics that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And the reason why nothing can travel faster than the speed of light is because if something travels faster than the speed of light, you lose causality. Namely, you can see a ca an effect before the cause. Ladies and gentlemen, if this turns out to be true, if this modern physics, if this new neutrino physics turns out to be true, what this really means is that once again the creator and the observer get 100% completely redefined. Because you can then observe, you can then observe something before its creation. Do we appreciate the magnitude of that statement? You can observe something before its creation. What I like to say is, you know, we can still as scientists gather around blackboards and root each other on because we'd have new physics to do. But at the same time, it makes us take a step back and realize that we once again did not know everything that we thought we did. But that is the only what it means for science. Imagine what this means for art. If you can observe a piece of work before its creation, and we already agreed that in modern art, creation was part of the art itself. What does this mean for art? You can at this point observe pure intention. So now I'll give you the one equation that I want you to take out of this and my biggest piece of art that I could possibly come up with because I am so far from an artist, it's not funny. What I hope that you take out of this talk today is that there are a lot of similarities between art and science. We have started from the role of the cave as being Plato's enemy to being now people that describe the world of the unseen and possibly today being able to describe the world that has not yet even been created. We can both describe it, but we usually tend to do it from one side alone. I create science and that's fine. An artist creates art or music and that's fine. But ladies and gentlemen, as time goes on and as the connections between art and science grow stronger. We cannot go it alone.
because otherwise we'll keep running into the same roadblocks that we always have. Instead, I believe if we approach it together, we look for the quantum connections. We look for the connections between our fields. We look for the connections between ourselves. And we look for the connections between the problems that we're trying to solve. This will lead us not only to open up our entire minds, but it will allow us to evolve. So I think a good place to end is since Einstein might be currently challenged with this new idea of neutrinos, I think we should also challenge his original quote, that imagination is more important than knowledge. And I hope that you can agree with this new quote, that creativity and observational imagination is the pathway to human evolution. Thank you. So my little guy has question marks on it, which we will do in a moment. We'll take questions uh, amongst the three of us in a moment. But uh, first, I would like to have everybody give a warm round of applause for the speaker of the day, really, um, Elise Wagner. Thank you all for coming. This is an extraordinary opportunity for me in my career. Um, I've sort of been working towards this for many, many years, and I have been a working artist for a long, long time, and my medium of encaustic is just an incidental aspect of what I have been preoccupied with for quite some time, which is the interpretation of science and reality. Uh, that is something that I have observed in art and, and just by following CERN and by following the news and some of the extraordinary research that's been done. So I am, in, this, in some ways, I am just so thrilled to be here because it, it's culminating into everything I've ever really worked towards. So I thank you for the forum to have this and have an interdisciplinary opportunity for two sections of your school to come together and have a really great dialogue about the subject. Um, and I want to thank James and also Ron. If it weren't for Ron, I would not be standing here. He uh, just saw my work and saw exactly the, what I had always wanted someone to observe in my work. And, 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 and then wrote this wonderfully eloquent essay in my exhibition catalog, which I can sign a copy for you of in the gallery. Um, I wrote a few things down. I'm kind of just talking about everything I wrote down. Um, I just wanted to kind of end with this. Um, historically, the innovations and discoveries of science have influenced artists from da Vinci to Van Gogh, Kandinsky, and de Kooning. Uh, and my work aims primarily to interpret reality in nature sought by the diligence, the due diligence of scientists and scientific research by translating its many symbols. So that's what I, I am doing. And what I'm ultimately after is to bring the intangible and the unseen into visual reality. So I am not a scientist. <laughs> I am an interpreter of science. <laughs> 